Hello, everyone. Welcome to Can Do MS's uh, three-part webinar on drug and healthcare access. We're pleased to bring you part two of this series on increasing your reach. For more information about Can Do MS, please visit our website, CanDo-MS.org. To join us this evening, uh, we're joined by pharmacist Lisa Aquinalo. And Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Thanks, Brian. Like you said, my name is Lisa Aquilano. I am a clinical pharmacist at Emory Healthcare in Atlanta. I work in our outpatient MS clinic where I have the unique opportunity to work alongside physicians, nurses, social workers, and other members of the healthcare team to manage medication therapy for patients living with MS. In addition to providing education to my patients about their medications, my favorite part of my job is to help patients gain access to their much needed MS medications. There are many barriers in accessing care for patients with MS, both direct and indirect. The barriers I'm going to focus on today include cost, insurance, provider availability, and transportation. Since my background is clinical pharmacy and my, my daily responsibilities in my clinic include helping patients gain access to their MS medications, much of my presentation is focused on medication access. So access is different for everyone living with MS because everyone's MS is different. Access implies that the patient has healthcare coverage. But on the other hand, it also applies getting access to the providers and needed specialists and being able to obtain medication and services that you need without unnecessary burdens. Even with insurance, substantial numbers of people with MS have plans that pay nothing toward prescription medication, limit their access to specialists, and restrict their choice of hospitals and providers and the demand for neurologists or MS specialists exceeds the current supply. If you are someone without health insurance, you can find out if you are eligible for a health insurance marketplace plan or Medicaid. Use healthcare.gov to begin the process of determining your eligibility for any of these programs and costs to you or call 1-800-318-2596. This is a great first step if you are uninsured and you want to take a look at the insurance plans that are available. I'm going to start with a question I have for everyone to think about. Do you think the cost of prescription MS treatments is reasonable or unreasonable? If you are thinking the cost of MS medications is unreasonable, you are in good company. In 2015, the National MS Society also asked this question. And of the almost 8,000 people living with MS who responded, almost 80% felt that the cost of MS treatments are unreasonable. Continually escalating prices have created a significant barrier to treatment, forcing higher costs and increased stress for individuals and families, causing a greater burden for people who already live with a chronic condition. All MS medications cost approximately 66 to almost $100,000 per year. Prices are continuing to rise each year and competition has not driven down these prices. In addition to high and rapidly escalating medication prices, people with MS report increasing out-of-pocket costs, confusing and inconsistent formularies, and we will discuss what a formulary is later in a moment, and a complex approval process that stand in the way of getting the treatments they need. Additionally, a growing number of health plans have high deductibles or cost sharing components that shift more of the financial burden onto patients. These challenges can cause delays in starting a medication or changing medication when a treatment is no longer working. Delays may result in new MS activity and cause even more stress and anxiety about the future for people already living with the complex challenges and the unpredictability of MS. In the next few slides, I'm going to describe some of the terms I mentioned on the previous slide. Let's discuss costs when it comes to your medications and break down each out-of-pocket expense. All the terms on this slide apply when you are using insurance to pay for your medications. The copay is the amount of money you pay when you get your prescription filled, 
which is determined by your health plan. This is the cost of a covered medication. This copay is usually a fixed amount, such as a $75 copayment for your medication. Coinsurance is a little different from a copay. Instead of it being a fixed amount, coinsurance is a percentage of the total cost of the medication with the rest paid for by your insurance after you meet your deductible. For example, your plan may cover 80% of the cost while you are responsible for 20% of the cost out of your pocket. This percentage may not seem like much, but we, when we are talking about a medication that costs $7,000 per month, the out-of-pocket co cost would be $1,400. I think this is unreasonable. The deductible is the amount you pay for healthcare services before your health insurance begins to pay. There are different types of insurance coverage. Publicly or government-funded insurance includes, but is not limited to, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, TRICARE, VA benefits, and Department of Defense benefits. Commercial or private insurance is insurance that you would get through your job. Many insurances on the healthcare marketplace available through the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare are considered commercial insurance, as long as the insurance is not part of the expanded Medicaid service. Coverage for healthcare expenses come from either your pharmacy or your medical benefit part of your insurance plan. The pharmacy benefit usually covers self-administered medications like your pills and injections. Through your pharmacy benefit, you usually pay a copay and sometimes coinsurance. The medical benefit usually covers medications administered by a healthcare professional, like your medications you would get at a physician's office, healthcare facility, or an infusion center. Through your medical benefit, you will usually pay coinsurance. Step therapy is trying less expensive options before stepping up to drugs that cost more. Let's dive into step therapy a little further. Even though your insurance may require step therapy, the MS practice guidelines created by the American Academy of Neurology don't have the same recommendations. In general, they don't have recommendations saying you have to try one MS medication before you try another. Based on the course of your MS, your symptoms, your MRI, you and your neurologist will pick the most appropriate medication for you. Unfortunately, that may not always align with what your insurance company wants you to try. Insurance companies have what they call step therapy, which is a process that encourages the use of less costly medications. In general, you are required to try a step one medication before a step two medication is eligible for coverage. In order to step up to the treatment prescribed, your doctor must show that the treatment that the insurance would prefer you to be on is not appropriate for you. In addition, some plans may require you to try more than one treatment before moving on to another treatment. Let's talk about a tiered formulary. This table is for illustrative purposes only, but I wanted to show you what this type of formulary may look like. Medications on a health plan formulary are often grouped into tiers, which are levels that determine how much a patient will pay out of pocket for a medication. Generally, the higher the tier, the higher the copay. This usually applies to the pharmacy benefit of the insurance plan. For MS treatments covered under the medical benefit, there is usually no tiered formulary list. However, health plans determine whether or not the treatments will be covered. If a medication is not covered, the plan will not pay anything and the patient is responsible for the full price of the medication. MS treatments are classified as specialty drugs. Specialty drugs require special handling, administration, or monitoring because specialty drugs are generally for only certain patients your health plan may put a restriction in place. This means there might be some approvals needed before you can get your treatment. A question that I get a lot when I'm discussing a new MS medication with my patients is, will my insurance cover this medication? 
All insurance plans are different, and I will explain to you in the next few slides how your doctor's office and pharmacy determine whether the medication will be covered. But if you want to be proactive and do some research on your own to determine which MS therapies are covered by your plan, there are several ways to do that. One way is to call the number on the back of your insurance card. There are usually several numbers on the back of the card, and I would call the, summer, the member services number first. You can also go to your insurer's website. They will have lists of preferred medications on your plan. Just be sure you are looking at the correct list for your individual plan. Or you can review your summary of benefits and coverage, which you can get directly from your insurance company through the mail or by finding the link on their website. You will see these slides come up during the presentation. They are reminders of ways you as a patient can be your own advocate. I can't emphasize enough the importance of you as a patient to take responsibility for your own health and to educate yourself on all the different aspects of your health. Just by listening to this webinar, you are being your own advocate. So the first tip I'm going to give you is to know your type of insurance. Is it private or government funded? Know your benefits. What are my co-pays? Do I have co-insurance? How much is my deductible? Know which medications are covered under your plan. And that you can find out by contacting your insurance company. Now I'm going to discuss how the doctor's office and pharmacy work with your insurance to determine whether a medication is covered under your plan. Some of you may already be familiar with the terms listed on this slide, but if not, I want to introduce you to them. These are all part of the process to get your MS medications approved by your insurance. The first term on the slide is a prior authorization or PA. The PA is the process of obtaining approval from the insurance company before they will cover the medication prescribed by your provider. This is one way to find out if the medication is covered by your insurance. We are going to discuss this process in more detail on the next slide. If a prior authorization is denied, I want to make sure you know your options for the next step in the process. An appeal letter is when you ask the insurance company to reconsider its decision to deny coverage of your medication. This is usually a written letter explaining the reasons why you need that particular medication. Anyone can do the appeal, including you, the patient, or a caregiver, but it is best to have your provider's office write this letter on your behalf. They will be able to include critical clinical information and supporting medical literature that is needed to get the medication approved. Along with the letter, they may submit clinical notes from previous doctor visits, MRIs, and lab results. And we are gonna discuss the appeal process in more detail in a moment. Another option if your PA is denied is something that is called a peer-to-peer -peer review. This is usually a phone conversation between a doctor at your insurance company, so the person that's refusing to pay for the medication, and your doctor, the person who is requesting the medication. I give you all these terms because when a medication is denied by your insurance, I want you to call your doctor's office and ask them to write an appeal or to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. So let's dig a little deeper into the prior authorization process. Most insurance plans will require a prior authorization to be completed for almost all MS disease-modifying therapies. It is uncommon for a PA not to be required, as these medications are expensive. In my experience, about five to 10% of the time, an insurance will say that a PA is not required. I see this most often with my Medicare plans. The prior authorization or PA process starts when your doctor sends the prescription to your pharmacy. The pharmacy will submit the claim to your insurance. That is when a message will instantly come back to the pharmacy notifying them that the medication needs a prior authorization. Then the pharmacy will contact the doctor's office to let them know that a PA is required. The doctor's office will then communicate with the insurance company the reasons why the medication was prescribed, and usually this is done by filling out a specific form from the insurance company. The insurance asks several questions on the PA form, including what is the diagnosis of the patient? What is the dose of the medication? What other medications has the patient tried and failed or tried and could not tolerate based on side effects. 
for your diagnosis. Then your insurance company will review the information supplied by your doctor's office. This may take anywhere from a few minutes or it can take up to a few weeks. So I submit most of my PAs electronically and may get an instant approval, but not all doctor's offices use this method. I will say that most PAs that I do take an average of 72 hours. This is an important time frame to remember as this process should not take too long. If you find yourself waiting a long time to get your medication, talk to someone in your doctor's office to find out the status of the prior authorization and ask if you can do anything to help. It is important to alert your doctor's office if there is a delay in the prior authorization to avoid any potential lapse in treatment as this could affect your health. Or you can even call your insurance company to check on the status. Your insurance can company can tell you the day they receive the information from your doctor's office, and usually they can tell you the day the outcome is due, the outcome being whether the medication is approved or denied. Now, if you call and they, your insurance company says that they have not received any information from your doctor's office, please call your doctor's office to remind them to submit your PA for your medication. This is another way I encourage my patients to be their own advocate. If the prior authorization is denied, no need to worry. It happens often, and there are many strategies to continue moving forward to get you on your medication. In some cases, your doctor may choose an alternative but equally effective medication that will be covered or approved by your insurance or your doctor's office can ask the insurance company for a review of the decision. This is the appeal or peer-to-peer. -peer. So let's first discuss the appeal process. This is one of the first things I do in my clinic when a PA is denied. I send an appeal letter. All the instructions on how to do an appeal will usually be on the denial letter sent to you by your insurance company. You can provide this information to your doctor's office if they don't get a letter from your insurance company as well. If you don't receive the denial letter, call your insurance company and ask them to send it to you. Like I mentioned earlier, your doctor's office should complete the appeal process, even though the denial will say that you can do it. Keep in mind, some insurance companies will require you to sign a consent allowing your doctor's office to appeal for the medication on your behalf. Your insurance company will usually have the form for you to sign and it should be submitted with your appeal. There are different ways to appeal, and many times I do both for my patients. The first type of appeal is an internal appeal, which is when your insurance company is asked to conduct a full and fair review of its decision. The first time you send an internal appeal, it's called the first level appeal, and if that's denied, you can oftentimes send a second appeal called a second level appeal. There are also external appeals where an independent third party company outside of your insurance company will review the information and make a decision on whether to approve or deny the medication. The appeal process takes a little longer than the PA process. I've seen internal appeals take as long as 30 days and I've seen external appeals take as long as 60 days. But really important, I've also seen appeals take only 24 hours to have an outcome. On average, however, it takes 14 to 30 days. Again, call your doctor's office and or your insurance company to check on the status. Be your own advocate. Lastly, if your doctor's office is not willing to submit an appeal letter and it is now up to you, go to the specific website for the medication you are prescribed. They usually have appeal template letters you can use to start your own appeal letter. Again, I want to emphasize the importance of being your own advocate. Follow your medication through the approval process. Contact your insurance company or doctor's office to check on the status, especially if you haven't heard anything in a few days. If your medication is denied, make sure to contact your doctor's office about next steps in the process. There are additional changes that may affect your access to treatment. In some cases, Health plans may change their formulary or preferred medication list. That means the treatment that you are on may no longer be covered or may cost you more money. 
If this happens, you'll get a letter from your health plan. It's important to know that you have the right to challenge the plan's decision so you can stay on your current MS treatment. This would be a circumstance where an appeal or a peer-to-peer -peer would also be appropriate. Your health plan may also allow patients currently on the medication to remain on the current treatment. Be sure to reach out to your healthcare providers to let them know about any formulary changes. If you enroll in a new health plan, make sure your treatments are still covered. Do some research before choosing a health plan to pick one that includes coverage of the medication you are already on. The National MS Society MS Navigator can help you do this. Also, you can even contact the manufacturer of the medication you are on to see if they also have a navigator that can help you choose the correct plan to make sure you can stay on your current treatment. Keep in mind, your treatment will still need to be approved by your new health plan. The amount you owe for your treatment may change. Again, be sure to reach out to your healthcare providers to let them know if you do have a new insurance plan. This is the general process for accessing your medications, and more specifically, to access financial resources available for your medication. The first step is to complete a start form for your medication. We will discuss start forms in detail on the next slide. Once the start form is submitted to the manufacturer of the specific medication, that kicks off the process for getting access to that medication, whether you have insurance or not. If you do have commercial insurance, always take advantage of manufacturer copay cards that can lower your copays to as low as $0 a month. For those patients with no insurance or high copays despite having insurance, Patient assistance programs and foundation assistance is available. These programs do have eligibility requirements and sometimes an additional application or form needs to be submitted to access these resources. Let's talk about start forms. All MS medications have a start form. If you have ever been on a treatment for MS, I am sure you have filled one of these forms out. Start forms enroll you into the manufacturer support program for the specific medication you are starting or currently on. The support program usually includes in-home or over-the-phone over nurse injection training for injectables, free access by phone to nurse educators for questions about your medication or about MS itself. And if you need financial support for your medication, such as a copay card, the manufacturer support program is the best place to start. These forms can be downloaded from the medication's website. Each form has a portion for the patient to fill out and also a section for your provider to complete. You may also be assigned a patient navigator or coordinator. A patient navigator through the manufacturer support program is your personal guide during your treatment. They are there to assist you through the process and check on you during treatment. Once you are enrolled, the program will contact you to sign up for all the benefits but you have to pick up the phone. They often call from unknown numbers. Let's talk about how your MS treatment gets to you. MS treatments are classified as specialty drugs like I mentioned earlier. Specialty drugs require special handling, storage, administration, or monitoring. Specialty drugs may cost more and sometimes have restrictions placed on them. For example, a prior authorization that we discussed earlier is a type of restriction. Some MS medications can be filled at a retail pharmacy where you can go pick it up like most other types of medications, but most of these disease-modifying therapies for MS can only be filled at a specialty pharmacy. This is a pharmacy that coordinates the processing, storage, delivery, and distribution of these drugs. Many specialty pharmacies offer support services to patients, including medication, adherence tools, and education about MS. Your doctor will send your MS prescription to a specialty pharmacy if needed. Your specialty pharmacy might be part of your health system or hospital. In many cases, your health plan may require you to use a specific specialty pharmacy. These are pharmacies that you don't drive to pick up your medication. They're considered closed door and instead will ship your medication to your home 
or other designated location of your choosing, such as your place of work. Many specialty pharmacies that are associated with a retail pharmacy will give you the option of shipping it to your local pharmacy where you can pick it up at your convenience. Specialty pharmacies specialize in shipping refrigerated items, so you don't have to worry about that. And they usually ship overnight, so you get them quickly. Keep in mind that many of these pharmacies are calling from different states or from 1-800 numbers, so it is an unlikely you will recognize the number when they call you. They also call from several different numbers each time they try to reach you. It is important to pick up the phone to answer these calls to arrange for the delivery of your medications. If you are due for a refill, don't wait for them to call you. I always tell my patients when they have about seven to 10 days worth of medication remaining, go ahead and call your pharmacy to set up delivery of your next refill. The number to your pharmacy is usually found on the label of your medication and also have the number saved in your phone. And please be your own advocate. Know the name and phone number of the pharmacy who sends your MS medication to you. During times of changing jobs or insurance plans, you may find yourself in a transition period and without coverage for your medication. Contact the Manufacturer Support Program for your MS medication. They usually have bridge programs where they can send you temporary free medication in the interim until your coverage gets figured out. For beta Theron, it's called the Beta Bridge Program. For Tecfidera and Vumerity, it's called the Quick Start Program. For Abagio, it's called the One Start Program. If you are not sure if your medication has this type of program, just ask. Copay card programs are offered by drug manufacturing companies as a direct way to lower out-of-pocket costs for prescription drugs for eligible patients. These cards can enable patients to afford medications preferred to them by them and their physicians. Patients with commercial or private insurance are eligible to enroll in the program. Copay cards are usually not need-based. They often have monthly caps or maximums for the amount of money they will contribute toward the copay. They all have a maximum amount, but it is usually between $7,000 to $18,000 per year. Many times you will need to re-enroll after a year or at the end of each calendar year. So if you have not been paying a copay for your medication and all of a sudden your copay jumps up, you should call the copay card program to see if you have met your monthly limit, your maximum limit, or you may just simply need to re-enroll. You enroll in these programs by filling out the start form we discussed earlier. The information contained on this slide is for your reference. This table includes the injectable medications used to treat MS and the corresponding website and the phone number where you will find information on the copay card program. This slide contains information on where to go to inquire about the copay co card programs for oral MS treatments. And finally, here's the information on how to find information on the copay card programs for the infused MS treatments. But what if you don't have insurance? Don't worry, free drug programs to the rescue. Prescription assistance programs or PAPs have emerged in an effort to help patients who lack insurance, health insurance or prescription drug coverage obtain, obtain the medications they need. These programs are typically offered by pharmaceutical companies to provide, to provide free or low-cost prescription drugs to qualifying individuals. These programs are also available for patients who may have prescription drug coverage, but their co-pays are too high. For example, patients with Medicare may have their treatment approved, but the out-of-pocket costs can still be quite prohibitive to a point where you still might not be able to start the medication. Patient assistance programs, or PAPs, can provide assistance to Part D enrollees and interface with Part D plans by operating outside the Part D benefit to ensure separateness of Part D benefits and PAP assistance. The PAPs assistance on behalf of the PAP enrollee does not count towards a Part D beneficiary's true out-of-pocket cost, or TROOP. The calculation of TROOP is important for determining whether an individual has reached the threshold or catastrophic coverage under the Part D benefit, which is often a time when copays are very high. 
So in other words, this will not go through your insurance, so the cost of the medication doesn't apply to deductibles or your out-of-pocket max. These programs generally have a separate application that must be completed by you and your prescriber. However, many patient assistance programs can be accessed through the manufacturer support program that you already enroll into when you completed the START form. Many times, the PAP assistance requires you to re-enroll after a year or at the end of a calendar year. So make sure you know when you would need to re-enroll. The program often contacts you well in advance so you don't have any lapse in treatment. This slide shows a reference table that lists the websites and phone numbers for various patient assistance programs. If you are not sure if a medication has an assistance program, you can simply perform an internet search. This is one of the few times it's acceptable to just Google it. Here is the slide for the injectable medications. Keep in mind, the website and phone number for the PAP assistance may be the same as the copay assistance or manufacturer support program phone number or website. This slide shows a reference table that lists the website and phone numbers for PAP assistance for oral medications. Mavenclad PAP is not available online at this time. Mavenclad will email, fax, or send out an application to you. You just need to call the number listed on the screen. This slide is for the infused MS treatments. The top row is Ocrelizumab or Ocrevus, which is also the same company that makes Rituximab or Rituxan. The Genentech Patient Foundation provides free medicine to people who don't have insurance, whose treatment is not covered by their insurance or is denied by their insurance, or those who are struggling with high out-of-pocket costs. This includes patients with Medicare. It is need-based, but the income limits are usually pretty high for these programs. For example, for Genentech, for a household size of two, you will qualify if you make less than $100,000 per year. So for our patients with federal or state healthcare, such as Medicare, who manufacturer copay cards are not available or not enough, we also have private foundations. These programs exist to provide direct financial assistance to insured patients who cannot afford the copayments and coinsurance were required to access prescribed medications. I mostly use these foundation or grant programs for my Medicare patients in the donut hole or in the catastrophic coverage phase. These programs are great because they do not delay patient care or access to medication because they provide instant eligibility determination. They usually will grant a certain amount of money, and when the grant runs out, you can renew it as long as there are still funds available and you still meet the eligibility requirements for assistance. In some cases, you may be approved for an open fund, which will provide financial assistance for the full calendar year or until funds are exhausted. It is very easy to apply. A patient can do it, or the pharmacy or provider's office can do it on the patient's behalf, with their permission, of course. It can be done over the phone or online, and it only takes minutes. Many of these foundations have several different financial programs, so they are not limited to financial assistance for medication copays. For example, the Patient Advocate Foundation has a copay relief fund, but they also offer case management services, which I will discuss in a moment. A very important caveat to foundation assistance is that it is always subject to the availability of funds, and there is no guarantee such funds will be available. The first foundation I want to introduce you to is the Patient Access Network Foundation, or the PAN Foundation. There are 57 medications on PAN's list of covered medications, including all MS disease-modifying therapies, whether they are injectable, oral, or infusions. The only exception for this is rituximab. They have medications for acute relapse, including prednisone and other steroids, medications for symptomatic treatment of MS like Tizanity, Baclofen, and Pyrit and Dantrolene that they can help pay for. PAN also offers financial assistance for travel expenses. I also like that when you get approved for PAN Foundation assistance, they have a 90-day look-back look back period. So if you have outstanding copays due to your pharmacy that you've incurred in the past 90 days, they will be covered by the foundation grant. Visit their website or give them a call to learn more about the program and its eligibility criteria. 
It's often very difficult to track whether a foundation has funds available. Remember what I said earlier about how foundation funds are not always available? Developed by the Pan Foundation, Fund Finder is a free resource that provides this information in one place and notifies you when a disease fund opens at any of the nine participating charitable patient assistance foundations. These include Good Days, HealthWell, Patient Advocate Foundation, just to name a few. Fund Finder pulls in information about each disease program status from the websites of those foundations. In mid-April of this year, the PAN Foundation launched a new waitlist feature. The Disease Fund Waitlist is a list of patients waiting to apply for assistance from a closed fund at the PAN Foundation. Patients may add themselves to the waitlist or be added by their healthcare provider, pharmacy, or caregiver. All patients or the individual acting on their behalf must provide a valid email address in order to sign up for the waitlist. The waitlist enhances the PAN Foundation's ability to serve patients on a first-come, first-served basis by giving those on the waitlist the first opportunities to apply for assistance when a fund opens. If the MS disease fund is closed, which it often is, I encourage you to sign up for the waitlist to ensure that you're notified when the MS disease fund opens for applications. When funding becomes available for a specific disease state, Individuals on the disease fund waitlist will be notified by email that the fund is open for applicants. So if you do sign up for the waitlist, I encourage you to check your email regularly so you do not miss out on important funding notifications. The individuals on the waitlist have the opportunity to apply before the general public during the waitlist status. Once you are notified that the fund is open, the application period is open for two business days. At the end of the two business day period, Pan Foundation no longer accepts applications from the wait list. If you don't apply within the two business days, the application period closes and you will be removed from the wait list. However, you can put your name back on the wait list at any time. If you do apply within two business days, on day four, the Pan Foundation notifies eligible patients or healthcare providers that, that applied on the patient's behalf if they will receive a grant or not receive a grant. If you do not receive a grant because the funding runs out before all eligible waitlisted patients get assistance, the remaining patients will stay on the waitlist but move closer to the top. They will be notified the next time the disease fund opens in waitlist status and will have to submit an application again. Here is another time I want to encourage you to be your own advocate. Know what type of assistance is out there for your MS medication. Sign up for the Fund Finder and the Pan Foundation Disease Fund waitlist. Let's talk about a few other foundations out there that can help you with your treatment costs. Not only do these foundations help with medication copays, they also help with health insurance premiums, deductibles, and coinsurance pediatric treatment costs, and even travel-related costs. HealthWell is a foundation I use often. As you will see, the eligibility criteria for each of these foundations is very similar. Many require you to have some form of insurance, but there can be restrictions on the type of insurance. For example, some foundations do not offer funds to patients with private insurance, and they only offer assistance to patients with Medicare. HealthWell is available to patients with either private or publicly funded coverage, but the PAN Foundation, for example, is only available to patients with Medicare insurance. Other requirements include income eligibility criteria, and most programs have a general requirement that you are receiving treatment in the U.S. Good Days also offers financial assistance for copays, as well as health care premiums and travel expenses. To be eligible for Good Days, you must have Medicare, military or federal medical insurance, and 50% of the medication must be covered by the insurance. The assistance fund is an open fund, meaning no limits to the assistance amount. When I inquired about the amounts of the fund, they stated they are very generous. The Patient Advocate Foundation has several different programs available for financial assistance. 
So this is not just limited to copay support. They offer case management services and work to identify and reduce the challenges that patients are having when seeking care. It is like having your own personal advocate to help you find resources and services to help you meet all your health needs. They also have a national financial resource database that has a list of potential organizations that may have programs to address many different types of needs from academic scholarships to even childcare resources. Needy Meds is not a foundation, but it is a free online information resource of programs that provide assistance to people who are unable to afford their medications and healthcare costs. This is a one-stop shop that will provide you with all the options for assistance for your specific medication. They also offer a pharmacy discount card to help with the cost of certain medications. Now we are going to shift gears from focusing on medication access to other types of access, including how to find a provider in your area, how to find services or assistance for your needs from your community, and other ways to look for much needed resources. For those of you who have private insurance, such as Blue Cross, United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, most major plans offer a case management program that can assist you in locating resources in your area to meet some of the needs that have arisen. Call customer service or the number on the back of your card and ask to speak with a nurse or a case manager. If you purchase a Medicare Advantage or supplemental plan, these plans offer what they refer to as concierge services that will provide you with assistance locating and putting services into place. Your local hospital, community action program, Rotary and Lions Clubs or places of worship are also good resources. Access to affordable, high quality healthcare is essential for people with MS to live their best lives. Choosing the right provider is one of the most important decisions you'll make about your healthcare. Remember, you're looking for a provider you can trust and work with to improve your health and well being. So take time to think about what you need. And with MS, you will usually need to see more than one type of provider. I'm going to take a quick moment to give you an overview of who your providers are. So your primary care provider is the person you may see for most of your general health issues, like blood pressure or cholesterol. A specialist is someone you see for certain services or to treat a specific condition. For example, you see a neurologist for your MS and you may see a urologist if you have any bladder issues. If you have insurance, check your insurance plan for a list of doctors and hospitals. You can do this by calling the number on the back of the card. You can also visit your insurance company's website, find the provider locator, put in your zip code and the distance you are willing to travel. Then the names and contact information for providers who accept your insurance will be available to you. You can then call the number of the provider and see if they have appointment availability. It's important to confirm if the provider is in network or out of network with your insurance plan. Generally, you will have lower fees with in network providers. Keep in mind, in some cases, your health plan may assign you a specific provider. You can also ask your friends and family if they have providers that they like. Call that office and see if they take your insurance. Another easy way to locate a provider is to go to the National MS Society's Resources and Support section. If you look at the right side of the slide, this is what the Find Doctors and Resources section of the website looks like. Not only can you find neurologists, but also eye doctors, physical, occupational, and speech therapists, rehab centers, mental health professionals, urologists, and many other types of healthcare providers. You can also connect to other resources in your community, including attorneys, home care aides, find resources for obtaining adaptive vehicles, and more to address all the unique challenges of living with MS. Now, once you've found a provider, it is important that he or she be the right provider for you and your needs. Before the visit, come up with a list of questions that you want to ask and topics that you want to discuss. If you are interested in, in a particular treatment, 
The website for that medication often has lists of questions to help start conversations with your provider. Take notes during the visit and bring someone with you that can help you remember all the information that you want to share with the provider and all the information that the provider shares with you. After the visit, it's a good time to reflect on whether that provider is a good fit for you. Remember, it is okay to change to a different provider, and it might take more than one visit to figure out if a provider is the right one for you. How many of you have struggled with getting to your neurology office, infusion centers, or therapy appointment because you don't drive? Well, I want to provide you with some tips for finding transportation. The first place many people with MS look for help with transportation is their own social network. Don't be afraid to ask friends and family members for a ride. Often they are happy for a chance to help out and spend time with you. And they can always say no if it's inconvenient for them at that time, in which case you can try rescheduling. If an appointment is ongoing, like a weekly visit to a physical therapist, for instance, you might arrange a regular trip with a friend or family member. Sweeten the deal with an offer to pay or split the cost of gas, for instance. Even treating the driver to a cup of coffee can help. Other opportunities to access a ride or joining a carpool may exist in your community, including places of worship, at community centers, and other service organizations. Typically, the most affordable way to get around is public transportation, which can include bus routes, subways, or light rail services. A good place to start exploring your city or county's public transit system and its accessibility options is www.publictransportation.org. Here you can search by state for what's available near you. The American with Disabilities Act, or ADA, requires that any transportation provided to the general public must be available to people with disabilities. The ADA also requires all public transit public transit agencies to provide paratransit services to people who cannot use fixed routes public transportation because of their disability. Paratransit services supplement fixed route mass transit by providing individualized rides without fixed routes or timetables. Some health insurance companies may provide transportation or cover costs of transportation to and from medical appointments. Check with your insurance company to see what they offer. In addition, most individuals enrolled in Medicaid are eligible for transportation to and from medical care. Learn more about this at www.medicaid.gov. In general, before you call to arrange transportation through your insurance company or Medicaid, follow these tips. Have your member ID number ready. Have the address for pickup and the address of your destination ready. Know the time and date of the appointment, specify if you will need a lift, and specify if you are bringing someone with you. If you don't get the answer you are looking for from your insurance company, ask your insurance company who else you can contact. This goes for any service you are inquiring about to your insurance. Oftentimes, in agencies can offer additional, additional information even if they can't provide the specific service. Let's say no one is available to take you. Perhaps you live in one county, but transportation services are in another county, and your paratransit service has not been able to get you there because they are not permitted to leave their home county. The Transportation Assistance Grant Program was established to help members of the MS community remain as independent as possible and ensure all people with MS have the transportation necessary to get the best medical care. The program provides funding for reasonable parent transit fees or can even provide funding for minor auto repair on your own car. In partnership with Lyft and Uber, the program can also provide funding for transportation to and from appointments for MS care, which is limited to neuro neurologist visits and infusion centers at no cost to the person with MS. To qualify for the program, a person must have a documented diagnosis of MS for transportation through Lyft or Uber, the applicant must be able to enter the vehicle independently or with the help of a caregiver who will accompany them, and any mobility aid they require must fit in a standard vehicle trunk. They must also have a cell phone capable of receiving and sending text messages. 
Individuals with MS can apply for this program online at msfocus.org or request an application form by emailing transportation at msfocus.org or calling the number on the screen. In addition to transportation services, there are so many additional services offered to people with MS that are often overlooked. One organization that routinely offers many of these services that improve the quality of life to individuals with MS is MS Focus or the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. For example, the Brighter Tomorrow grant provides goods or services that will improve your life. Items vary from household essentials to hobby supplies. They can replace an appliance, get you a computer, wheelchair, walker, and cane. The application period for this grant is open from June 1st until September 1st, and the maximum value of the grant is $1,000 per recipient. The Emergency Assistance Grant provides full or partial financial assistance for urgent needs related to paying rent, utilities, or for medication. The Home Care Assistance Grant has several available services, such as arranging visits with occupational speech or physical therapists. There is a respite care program to allow the primary caregiver, caregiver of the MS patient the opportunity to tend to themselves. This program can also offer help when there is a transition from a stay at the hospital to coming home, and the program can arrange for home care services that include light house cleaning, grocery shopping, meal preparation, and transportation to and from appointments. They also have an annual cooling campaign that, where they give away cooling equipment to people who apply. I only named a few of the types of grants available from the MS Foundation. Please look for yourself at www.msfocus.org, then click on Get Help at the top of the screen, and then click on Grants and Programs. Need an MRI, but your copay is prohibitively high or you don't have insurance? The Multiple Sclerosis Association of America has a program to pick up that copay or the cost of an MRI. The MRI Access Fund assists with the payment of MRI scans for qualified individuals who have no medical insurance or cannot afford their insurance costs and require the exam to help determine a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or evaluate current MS disease progression. MSAA will refer you to an imaging center that is under contract with the program and will cover the cost of a brain MRI, C-spine MRI, or both. Or they cover the cost of your medical insurance copay or coinsurance balance up to a maximum of $600 per MRI. You will be responsible for costs exceed, exceeding the $600 per MRI. MSAA will actually pay the billing facility directly. They will even provide payment for past MRIs. All you have to do is apply to go to apply at www.mymsaa.org and download the application, or you can call MSAA directly to request an application. You do have to meet income eligibility guidelines and comply with program requirements. One of my favorite websites to find useful resources for my patient is at the top of the screen. The National MS Society has you covered from A to Z. Not only do they provide information on medication access, they provide information on what exactly MS is, its symptoms. It can also help you find a support group, navigate your insurance benefits, you name it, they do it. I can't tell you how important it is that you sign up with a navigator today. They will connect you to all the resources you need. You may not know what is out there for you, but your MS Navigator does. One group who I also have discussed several times during this presentation is the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, also known as MS Focus. It is a nonprofit organization focused on providing free services that address the critical needs of people with MS and their families, helping them maintain the best quality of life. MS Focus, provides grants to individuals with MS for much needed services and devices. Can Do MS, as you know if you're listening to this web webinar, delivers health and wellness to help families living with MS thrive. The Consortium of MS Centers is an organization made up of MS healthcare professionals like myself 
whose goal is to improve the lives of those affected by MS through the sharing of information and knowledge. As patient advocate, MSAA is very aware of the many complexities that arise in successful resource identification. My MS Resource Locator is designed to make your search for MS-related information and resources as easy as possible. Ten categories ranging from insurance to housing needs have been identified and researched to provide you with the most up-to-date information available. In each of these categories, a companion guide accompanies the information to help you navigate and select the best resource for you. The vision of the MS Coalition is to improve the quality of life of those affected by MS through a national network of MS organizations, including all the organizations that are mentioned on this slide. This slide contains additional resources for your reference. The National Infusion Center Association, or NECA, offers an online infusion center finder to locate centers throughout the U.S. that administer your infusible MS medication. The Novartis Patient Assistance Now is a website designed to help you find programs that may provide savings or resources, specifically for Novartis prescription medications. The National Council on Aging provides information about government programs and other benefits for eligible persons in need, including help with housing, heating bills, and more. People with MS are negatively impacted by the cost of MS treatments and services. It can be a daily struggle trying to figure out the complexities of the healthcare system just to be able to access the basics, such as medications, providers, and other services. These challenges create stress in the lives of people living with MS and their caretakers. But as you have seen, there are many types of programs available to help you gain access to what you need to do to live your best life. Most importantly, you are your own advocate. Ask for help when you need it take notes, and be involved in your own care. It has been such an honor and a privilege to be able to share this information with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Here are some additional links to websites and resources mentioned on the previous slide. Thank you, Lisa, and please watch the rest of our drug and healthcare access videos at www.candu-ms.org. Thank you to Lisa and to all of our sponsors. Thank you for watching.